The VLT, or Very Large Telescope, now being built in northern Chile, is already sending back results. Just look at this. A spiral galaxy, a hundred million light years away, and twice the size of ours. And here, the Dumbbell Nebula, a planetary in Valpecula. And those are taken with only one of the four eight-meter mirrors working. Imagine what you'll get when all four are working together. Something to look forward to. Well, we didn't get a meteor storm in October, might have done. We have a far better chance on November the 17th this year with the Leonids. A meteor, as I'm sure you know, is a tiny particle dashing into the Earth's air and burning away to produce the streak of radiation we call a shooting star. And that's all a shooting star is, a tiny particle burning away in the Earth's upper air. We get these when they pass through the dusty trail left by a comet, and this is what's going to happen. The meteors then in shower are going through space in parallel paths, and therefore, by perspective, they seem to radiate from one particular part of the sky known as the radiant. And the radiant's named after the constellation in which it lies, and for November, the radiant lies in Leo the Lion, so we call them the Leonids. And finding Leo is quite easy. Locate the Great Bear and use the pointers the wrong way, away from the pole star, and you'll come to the bright star Regulus and a curved line marking the sickle of Leo. And that's the constellation of the Lion, and the radiant is here. Now, the Leonids this year may be particularly interesting. So this stage, welcome back to Dr. John Mason. John, what is so special about the Leonids? Well, we see a few Leonid meteors every year when rates are 5 to 15 meteors per hour. But I suppose the shower is famous for the periods of enhanced activity that have occurred, with a few exceptions, every 33 or 34 years or so. And this enhanced activity is caused by a dense swarm of, of dust particles close to the parent of the Leonid stream, periodic comet Temple Tuttle, which has a period of 33 and a quarter years. Now, for a few years before and after the comet passes closest to the Earth's orbit, there's a possibility each November that we'll pass through the densest part of the swarm and that we'll get an outstanding Leonid shower. Now, Comet Temple Tuttle last passed closest to the Earth's orbit on March the 5th this year. And here's a picture of it taken by Martin Mobley on the 31st of January. And so the proximity of the parent comet to the Earth at the present time means that there's an increased likelihood of outstanding Leonid showers occurring. If the comet comes back every 33 years, why don't we get a major meteor storm every 33 years? Why are some missed out? Well, there are two problems. Firstly, there's a gravitational influence of planetary perturbations, particularly from Jupiter and Saturn. Now, here you can see a diagram of the orbits of the comet in orange and of the Earth seen from the side. The point where the comet's orbit dives down through the Earth's orbit is called the descending node. And at present, the Earth passes closest to this point on November 17th or 18th each year. Now, to see a great Leonid shower, the Earth must pass closely just outside the orbit of the comet. The trouble is that planetary perturbations swing the comet's orbit back and forth, as you can see here. The horizontal white line marks the position of the Earth's orbit. The wiggly orange line shows how the descending node of the comet swings to and fro either side of Earth's orbit. Sometimes the descending node is very close to the Earth's orbit, as you can see here. Sometimes it's inside the Earth's orbit and sometimes outside the Earth's orbit. In 1833 and 1966, the Earth passed 180,000 kilometers and 460,000 kilometers respectively outside the comet's orbit, and we got a great shower, such as the one shown in this impression of the 1833 storm. But because the filament of dust is rather narrow, if the mist distance is too great, the Earth doesn't pass through the densest part of the swarm, and we don't see an outstanding shower. This is what happened in 1899, when the mist distance was 1.8 million kilometers, 10 times further than it had been in 1833. Another problem is that the distribution of dust near to the parent comet is uneven. So even if the Earth does pass closely just outside the comet's orbit, we could go through a region where the dust is only thinly concentrated and we won't see very much. The comet has just been back. Have you noticed a build-up of Leonid activity over the past few years? Yes, we have. The shower was well observed in 1995, 1996 and 1997, particularly by members of the meteor section of the British Astronomical Association. 
Uh, in this diagram of Leonid activity in November 1995, collated by Meteor Section Director Neil Bone, we see the rise in Leonid activity and the peak on the early morning hours of the 18th with rates of just over 40 meteors per hour. That's noticeably better than the 5 to 15 meteors per hour of the lean years. Then in 1996, uh, meteor section results showed peak rates of 50 to 70 Leonid meteors per hour, with possibly a brief peak even higher than that. And that year, there was an unusually large number of bright Leonids, meteors we call fireballs. Now, in 1997, despite interference from the light of a, a bright moon, um, Leonid rates were fairly constant for 80 to 100 meteors per hour for possibly as much as 12 hours or so. And this activity is a good example of what we call the plateau in Leonid activity. Past records show that the periods of enhanced activity grow out of this plateau where rates are constant at 80 to 100 meteors per hour. Again, the 1997 shower appeared to be rich in bright meteors, maybe more so even than 1996. And all these results point to a gradual but marked increase in Leonid activity as the parent comet has drawn nearer. All right, John, you're the meteor expert. What's going to happen this year on November the 17th? <laughs> well, all we can do is make an educated guess. We do know that outstanding Leonid showers are most likely when the Earth closely follows the comet to the descending node and passes just outside the comet's orbit. Now, in general terms, that's exactly what's going to happen both this year and next. The trouble is that the mist distance is rather greater than we would like. The Earth is going to pass nearly three times as far from the comet's orbit as it did in 1966, and more than six times further than it did during the Great Storm of 1833. In some ways, the circumstances in 1998 and 1999 are quite similar to those for 1866 and 1867, and in those years, Leonid reached, reached a few thousand meteors per hour for a short period. In 1866, as you can see here, Leonid rates rose from around 5 meteors per minute at around midnight to 120 meteors per minute shortly after 1 o'clock in the morning and then back down again to 5 meteors per minute by 4 a.m. In 1867, bright moonlight drowned out the faintest members of the shower, but Leonid rates still reached 25 meteors a minute for a short period. There's no way we can ensure exactly what's going to happen this year. But I would be willing to say that if the sky is clear on the night of November 17th, 18th, what we will see is a quite respectable Leonid shower with rates comparable with the Perseids of August or the Geminids of December, maybe 80 to 100 meteors per hour. And there's a chance that out of this baseline activity, there could be a brief peak, spectacular peak of enhanced activity. We have one major advantage this year. There won't be any interference from moonlight. So for visual observation, John, um, what special equipment do you need? Well, the good thing is you don't need any. The most important thing is to be warm and comfortable. It can get jolly cold on November nights, particularly in the early morning hours. Mm -hmm. So wrap up warmly. Several thin layers are much better than one thick one. And get into a sleeping bag. Make sure you wear a hat, because a lot of body heat is lost through the top of the head. And you'll also need gloves. And personally, I prefer fingerless mittens because they do give some freedom of movement. Recline at a comfortable angle in a deck chair facing southeast or south. Make sure you pick as dark a site as possible, well away from any street lights or other artificial lighting. Put your report forms on a clipboard and use a red torch like this cycle rear lamp for illumination. It won't ruin your night vision once your eyes have grown accustomed to the dark. Make sure you have set your watch accurately to a radio or telephone time signal. You'll of course need pens and pencils and a rubber. Some people like to tie these to the clipboard to prevent them getting lost in the dark. You'll also need a long wooden stick or a ruler to line up along the paths of any meteors you see. And of course a thermos flask of hot soup or tea as you wish. And then all you need is lots of patience. Very well. There you are in your deck chair, staring up at the sky and concentrating grimly and you see a meteor. What do you do? Well, the first thing you do is hold up the ruler against the sky along the path of the meteor you've just seen. Extend the trap backwards in the direction from which it came and see if it comes from within the sickle of Leo. If it does, it's a Leonid. If not, a non-Leonid or sporadic. Make a quick note of the time on the form, the constellation in which you saw it, and whether it was a Leonid or sporadic. 
Some people like to plot the trails of all the meteors they see on a chart to work out where the radiant is, but you don't have to do that. Remember, it's just as important to note down the sporadics as it is to note down the Leonids. Yeah. Here's a picture of a bright sporadic over at the top left, photographed during the 1966 Leonid shower. The radiant is the yellow circle there. Quite often, a bright Leonid will leave a persistent train or a wake in its path. This is a trail of ionised and excited particles of air left behind as the tiny meteor slams into the Earth's upper atmosphere at 71 kilometres per second at a height of over 100 kilometres. You can record the details of any persistent trains on the form together with the brightness of any meteors you see by comparing the trails with nearby stars. The most difficult thing is to gather all the information that you need in the brief yes, time indeed. that you have when you see it. Mind you, if activity picks up and Leonids are falling at a rate of several a minute, you won't have time to do all that. You'll just have to record the time and whether it's a Leonid or not. And if Leonid activity is really high, then maybe all you'll be able to do is count the number of Leonids in one minute intervals, or maybe count the number that appear within a region of the sky defined by some bright stars, like, for example, within the bowl of the plough. Well, visual observation is fairly straightforward. Next, what about photography? Well, again, you need only basic equipment, and the procedure is quite simple. However, you may have to shoot a lot of film and be prepared to throw a lot of it away. You need a simple manual camera like this one that can take time exposures. Mount it on a tripod and point it at the sky, pointing upwards at an angle of about 45 degrees. You can put the camera on a clock drive, and then this has the advantage that the stars will appear as points rather than trails, but you don't have yeah. to do that. You must have a lockable cable release, like this one, to have opened and closed the shutter without jogging or vibrating the camera. Use fast film. ISO 400 is generally best if you've got a bit of light pollution or sky glow. Again, either colour or black and white, it doesn't really matter. You'll need to use either a wide angle or a standard 50mm lens on the camera, focused in infinity and would set to its widest aperture or lowest F number. Dew and frost can form on the lens, okay. so what I tend to do is to make up a dew pack out of cardboard uh, and fit it around the lens of the camera like that. As far as exposure times are concerned, 5, 10 or 15 minutes are generally the best. It depends on how dark your sky is. Use the longer exposures uh, if you have a dark sky. Each time, if you have, just open the shutter using the cable release, wait for 10 minutes, close the shutter and then repeat for as long as you like. Make a note of the start and end times of exposure and keep checking the lens for any dew. You've got to be patient and hope that any meteor trails that occur go through the field of view while the camera's exposing, maybe several. If Leonid rates are really high, you might be lucky uh, and see uh, a lot, and you might get a picture like this taken during the height of the 1966 storm. shows 61 Leonid yeah. trails in three and a half minutes. Mind you, that's exceptional. Yeah, very lucky indeed. Well, that's using an ordinary camera, but I know that you've been using video equipment. Yes, ordinary video camcorders generally aren't sensitive enough to pick up meteor trails. So this uses an image intensifier to amplify the light. The light's collected by this lens, a wildly wide-angle camera lens on the front, set to its widest aperture, focused in infinity. This basically is uh, an image intensifier inside this aluminium housing. And on the back here we have an ordinary CCD video surveillance camera. This diagram explains how the whole system works. The camera lens collects the light and focuses it onto a sensitive photocathode, which converts the photons of light into electrons. The electrons are accelerated by a high voltage, and each primary electron produces an avalanche of secondary electrons, amplifying the original signal. The electrons hit a phosphor screen, causing it to glow, producing a much brighter image of the area of sky imaged by the lens. The CCD video camera looks at the phosphor screen, and the view is continuously recorded on a video recorder. Well, let's have a look now, shall we, at um, the results of past Leonids. Well, here we've got a few clips edited together, and we start off the area of sky. Over to the left there, we've got the two stars, the pointers, in the bowl of the plough, and Leo is down near the bottom of the screen. And the first Leonid is going to be over towards the left of the screen, going towards the top left, and there it is. Next, we have a fairly bright Leonid travelling upwards from the centre of the screen. 
But not every meteor you see, of course, will be a Leonid. Here's a bright sporadic actually travelling towards the Leonid radiant. Sometimes things can get quite hectic. Here's two Leonids, only a second apart. The first just above and to the left of centre, the second to the top right. And here's a lovely bright Leonid close to the radiant with a persistent train down there at the bottom right. Not every meteor you see in Leo will be a Leonid. Here's a sporadic actually crossing Leo down at the lower right. And here's another Leonid going off the bottom right of the screen. And to finish, two bright ones, both with persistent trains. This one over towards the right and this one travelling up to the centre right of the screen. Well, on November 17, I'll be firmly at my home in Selsey, hoping for a clear sky, but uh, you won't be there. I know you're going to Darjeeling in India. Why India? Because it makes sense to monitor this year's Leonid shower from places on the Earth's surface as widely spaced as possible. We don't know if there's going to be an outstanding display this year, but if it does occur, it's likely to be very brief, possibly no more than an hour or so in duration. So the chance of seeing it from any one place on the Earth's surface is pretty slight, particularly during the hours of darkness and with the Leonid radiant high in the sky. You can see here that the Leonid radiant doesn't rise until about 10.30pm local time and is not at its highest until around 6 o'clock in the morning. So circumstances are best for viewing the Leonids in the pre-dawn hours. Now this year the Earth passes closest to the comet's orbit at 19.43 GMT on the evening of November the 17th, that's a Tuesday. However, any sharp peak in Leonid activity could be several hours before or after that time. Now Darjeeling is six hours ahead of Greenwich Mean Time. So as the Earth spins and as the Sun sets in Darjeeling at 17.20, it's still only late morning in Selsey. The Leonid radiant rises from Darjeeling while it's still daylight here. And if any Leonid outburst occurs between 1800 and 2200 GMT, we'll see it clearly from Darjeeling. Mind you, if any outburst occurs later, it'll be getting light in Darjeeling, but the radiant will be rising for you, so you'll see it and I will miss it. Well, we'll wait and see. Meanwhile, we're going to ask for help from Sky at Night viewers. If you'd like a report form, send an A4 envelope to this address, the Sky at Night, Leonid Watch, Science Line, PO Box 6161, London W12 8UQ, and you must have £1.17 worth of stamps on it, was six second class stamps will do, and we really do need your help. And I wonder, what are we going to see? Possibly a little, but with luck, we might get a really major meteor storm, as we had way back in 1966, and we'll soon know. John, thank you very much. If you want the latest news, then dial up our information line, 0891 800 or of course CFAX, page 620. When I come back next month, I'll be joined by Dr. Jasper Wall. And we'll be talking about the glorious history of the Royal Greenwich Observatory, which is now being closed down. Good night.